And very excited to welcome Greg Cohen. Greg is our principal percussionist, uh, principal of the section. Welcome, Greg. Hi, Martha. Hi, everybody. I hope you're, everyone's doing well. Uh, it's great to see you. And uh, it's, at the same time, it's great to be seen. <laughs> and you are the third of your three colleagues, of the three of you, this section, to come to lunch and listen. And we have enjoyed every one of you. This way, we also get a little of Andy with you in that great video. You just, this is a project you and he have been working on. Can you tell us about it? Correct. Uh, earlier in the pandemic, um, Andy Watkins had the idea of producing this um, six movement percussion duo work called Ur, capital R, a bunch of small little R's by an Argentine composer, Mauricio Cagle. Uh, this movement was uh, the third movement called Rigadoon or a, a stately court dance. Uh, for two uh, sort of small multi-percussion setups. Uh, my favorite part is Andy's giant uh, frog uh, there. Later on, you'll hear another movement. It's for two snare drums uh, called rim shots. And um, there's uh, so other movements incorporating other instruments that are very um, interesting. And so I thought, I, I noticed Andy, I think, played a xylophone rag in, in his Lunch and Listen, and Aaron um, did, a, I think, played some marimba. So I thought I would uh, focus on some percussion to do something a little bit different. <laughs> well, it, it's great. And I know all of our listeners always are curious about the, about the wide range of instruments that you are allowed to get the opportunity to play in your role in the percussion section. That's right. And as time has gone on, the collection or possibility of instruments that we hit, shake, scrape, or blow air through, as, as it may be, seems to keep expanding. Uh, for instance, when we did the Mason Bates Alternative Energy, uh, it was a large collection of car parts uh, to put together um, and for that show. But there have been all kinds of interesting instruments uh, that sort of the instrument as percussion as you think of it has expanded uh, towards spe specifically in the 20 in the, here in the 20th and 21st century as, as we've as we've gone along. So as principal, mm -hmm. your job is not just preparing your part and showing up and performing as part of the orchestra. Because you have to coordinate the who's playing what part, how, they, how they're set up on the stage, how you get from one instrument to the other. There's a choreography that I always find fascinating. And, yeah, and then yeah. source the instruments as well. That's exactly right. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's hard to know when, you, when you're young and you're just trying to win an audition to win a job, you don't know exactly what it is or what that means until you get into it and you see what, what it is. And I think principal percussion to different individuals across the country means maybe a slightly different thing and how they go about um, operating in the role, how they go about organizing their particular situation. And it's I think it's on some level part of their circumstance that is the does the orchestra does the institution own the hall or not own the hall? Do they, what collection of instruments do they own? Um, do they have a pool of players with, you know, instruments they might be able to source from? The artistic um, abilities of people who are, can, then, that can come in and play a particular part. And so it's a little bit different for, you know, for everyone. For, for me, 
I definitely feel that my role is um, in, in organizing everything that happens across the back is, is almost more important uh, on some level, certainly in leading up to the rehearsal period than it is almost of playing the part. And so I'm looking at, you know, what instruments are needed. Do, do we have them? Do we, can we borrow them? Do we, uh, should we buy them? Should we rent them? We look at a cost analysis, you know, for some of these large instruments, so, you know, the Berlioz <clears throat> bells come to mind or these large um, collections or sets of uh, Thai tuned gongs that keep coming up in uh, John Adams and other, other composers. Um, certainly, I think the car parts was something just to find and go away. <laughs> um, you know, we're certainly thinking about personnel needs. Uh, how many players does it do you need for a, partic a particular work and how many are needed for the entire show? We're thinking about the flow of those individuals on the stage. Do we want, you know, how much should they be moving around? Should they be in a particular spot? Every time you move from station to station, there's a risk, you know, I think to the player knocking over instruments or, you know, it's, it, it can be dark sometimes if you're playing a film. So I try to keep people in the same place. Um, it's good to know the ability of individual players, what they like to play, what they want to play, what they will excel at playing. Also, if it's a piece of repertoire where you've played it a number of times, uh, maybe it's good to let someone else play a part that you've played two, three, four, five times. I mean, Sorcerer's Apprentice comes to mind. We've played it a number of times. It's a famous glockenspiel part, but you know, the symbol and triangle part are wonderful too. And someone else can have the opportunity. That's totally fine. Um, you know, we're working with our wonderful production department in sourcing these uh, equipment. Uh, Paige and Nicole are wonderful. Um, in fact, back back to the Mason Bates, uh, I mean, they went down to a junkyard to source this stuff and found just an incredibly dirty uh, fuel tank that was part of the instrument list. And poor Nicole had to clean the <laughs> clean the thing up for us. Uh, but no, they they you know they do everything in their power to make make it comfortable for us to get the right instrument, the right stand, the right you know. Maybe we need to expand the stage and that and I'm just thinking again of the Mason Bates, the stage wasn't really big enough. So the we had to set up some tables next to the percussion stage thrust, which is the piece of stage that comes out. That, uh, we set up equipment uh, often. So, you know, th th thinking out of the box, thinking out of the stage, we had to create a little bit more stage there. And they were, you know, instrumental trying to make that happen along with the, with the stage crew, our wonderful stage hands put the large equipment exactly where I tell them. And, you know, I, I try to draw, um, diagrams pictures that Paige and nicole make look much better than my uh my scribble art <laughs> for those guys so that uh, they know where to put all the equipment at a particular time and then i very very carefully make very specific assignments for all the players so there's no question uh, come the first rehearsal beforehand they know exactly what notes they're supposed to play what instruments and it's up to the player then how they physically want to play those parts but they know exactly what they have to play uh you know long before long ahead of time that, that might be what it is in a nutshell. <laughs> well, thank you for the call up to the administrative team and working together um, to, su to support you so you can make your best music is something I know that they really value. It's ab absolutely, uh, there's no question, I can't do what I do without uh, production, personnel, the crew, everyone, really everyone, you know, making the decisions, because these all have costs, obviously, and, you know, it's a question with artistic, do we want to spend the money on something or not, and we, I think everyone just tries to do what makes sense in a particular situation, and it's a, it's a complete team effort, there's no way, no way can I do it by myself, uh, so... Yeah, my hat's off to the administrative team and everyone who helps helps in the cause and bring the music to life on the stage that we normally do week to week. So I do remember a couple of years ago now when we got the new marimba. Marimba. Yes. Too, yes. Right? Two of them. Um, but as time goes on, you know, I would say that you must have a wish list of mm -hmm. instruments that we should have as an orchestra that are used mm -hmm. increasingly. And then and you have some of your own instruments that you kind of bring to the table as well. Exactly. Yeah, I think it, the history of this institution is that I think way back, the Las Patronas group sort of gave us our first cash infusion. Uh, this is sort of before my time to purchase some of the basic instruments that we've used to this day, a, a, a bass drum, a xylophone, uh, some tam-tams. And then more recently, in the last couple of years, they again, uh, very graciously, and thank you Las Patronas once again uh, for that wonderful gift. Uh, you know, we, we were able to purchase a brand new glockenspiel, uh, two new marimbas, one with wood bars and one with synthetic bars, sort of for two different purposes. We'll use them both, uh, one probably more inside, one more uh, outside. And and yes, so uh, I, I'll bring also my own personal equipment. So I probably have 
13, 14 different drums, snare drums, different depths, um, lots of uh, cymbals, um, toys, a, a huge array of sticks and mallets. Um, I own my own mallet instruments, but we're using usually using the uh, orchestras uh, at you know on the stage. Uh, but sometimes we will bring in our own equipment. And same with the other uh, players, um, Andy, Aaron, uh, Ryan, and ev everybody else who plays, they have their own collection. So it's interesting trying to think about, do I want to use my piece of equipment? Maybe it's better, to, Andy has a better sounding snare drum for a particular you know purpose. In fact, when we did Shostakovich 11, I think I actually borrowed one of Andy's uh, snare drums and actually one of John Santos' uh, snare drums as well, just because the, the, the character of the sound was, I thought, called for, and I didn't feel that I, what I had... Uh, for that, those particular moments uh, was exactly the right thing. So yeah, we, we, we certainly share and we're always thinking about, you know, what what sound, you know, what mallet, um, or even in my, in my particular situation, where can I place someone to be additive to the musical moment to, to make it so that, you know, the player has the best possible chance to be successful in, in a particular situation. Sometimes there's short, you know, rehearsal time and one rehearsal, two rehearsals, or it's one difficult moment in a Mahler symphony that you only have a chance to go over once. So you have to sort of, you know, think about those things very carefully. Where's the giant Mahler box going to go? <laughs> you know, I mean, stuff like this. There's not a lot of time in rehearsal to experiment with things like that often. So a lot of thinking, I think, ahead of time to try to put people in their best light uh, is really um, paramount, I think. So when you travel, I mean, you went with the orchestra to China, yeah. which is a country rich in its own sounds and percussive sounds. Is yeah. it a hobby to kind of look around? Do you get to source things that way or do you, is it really <clears throat> out of now? Oh man, it's so dangerous traveling and hearing things because, you know, music is global and percussion is very global. I mean, there's cultures of every type, you know, that everywhere has have all kinds of interesting sounds. And so it's very dangerous because you always, wherever you are, you see something and you want it. <laughs> um, I mean, I remember growing up, my family uh, and I, we took a trip to Israel and we went to this Bedouin market somewhere and there's all these little, you know, hand drums everywhere. I was like, oh, I want this, I want that. And I think I still have three of them that survived from all that, all that time ago. But yeah, there was certainly quite a bit of sounds that we, we heard on, on the tour that, boy, we would have loved to have uh, taken, <laughs> taken back with us. No question about that. Fascinating. So one question here is, when you're having to source these instruments, how far in advance do you have to have to make sure you have enough time to rehearse? Right. So it's a good question. Uh, it's it's a moving target uh, in terms of final programming. Uh, usually, I try to as soon as a as a program becomes final and I know what the you know what we're actually going to play. <clears throat> at that point, I'll start the process immediately of you know do I have something? Do I not have something? And as quickly as possible, get get down to the bottom line of do we need to buy it? Do we need to rent it? Borrow it? If we don't actually have the uh, instrument, uh, you know, sometimes on rare occasion, you know, some, something music shows up very last minute, and you're just trying to make something happen. You know, sometimes you'll substitute instruments uh, if it doesn't make sense to you know rent something expensive for one note. Uh, I'm thinking of some of these movie soundtracks that we've done quite a bit of at this point. Um, you know, there's a lot of these sounds that I think like the, the players use in LA in the studios and whatnot. And uh, some of this stuff is very expensive to rent. Uh, so I think it's, it's just a question of how far in advance do you know definitively uh, what you're playing? You know, what the cost is uh, and whether it makes sense to how, you know, when and how to move forward with it. But as soon as I can, I try to wrap my head around what it is and try to try to act. Fortunately, I am married to the orchestra's principal librarian, so I do have pretty good access to, um, uh, should I say, inf I, I want to say information, but access to the music, <laughs> you know, when it becomes final, I can get it pretty easily. Uh, so that's, that's, so that's great. <laughs> when it's being contemplated in the earliest days. Well, yeah, I can, I can start wrapping my head around, okay, what, what do I need? <laughs> what do I need to do? You know, do I need to go to the junkyard for car parts or do I need to rent two giant things of, you know, tie gongs or, you know, giant, you know, cast bells from somewhere that are really heavy and expensive to ship? <laughs> well, you have insider information. I um, <laughs> And things that hold water, vessels with water mm -hmm. are also often used. Yes. So something that I was very looking forward to was the Tandune Water Concerto. And I... I you know, I, I can't wait till Steve has a chance to do that because it's, it's just wonderful. And y yes, uh, 
water creates all kinds of interesting um, sounds and, and, and the way specifically like in that piece in which the player can manipulate the water is really uh, fascinating. You know, we've you can take a gong and hit the gong, lower it in the water, it makes a sort of a ascending or descending pitch as you go in or out. And yeah, it's really, um, it's, it's really, really, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing piece. So when we do that again, as I know we will at some point, uh, that is one not to miss for sure. Yeah, I was really looking forward to that. Speaking of Steve Schick, I love yeah. the poster um, in the background there. It's about time. Yeah, That was an amazing month. And you guys really put everything you had into that. Um, it, was a, it was about time. It was about um, rhythm. It was about all these wonderful percuss percussion instruments. And it had the uh, performance of John Luther Adams' piece at the border. Yeah. As I look back in my career with the San Diego Symphony so far, this was really, I think, one of the pinnacle moments uh, for, for sure. And the day that we played the John Luther Adams across the border with Mexico, and that evening we came in and played the Takamitsu from Me Flows What You Call Time uh, as one of the soloists with the with the orchestra with with Steve conducting, I think was just a, just a surreal 24 hour period for me, truthfully. Um, yeah, the, the Anuk Suite uh, with all the players, uh, you know, uh, across the fence, you know, on, on both sides and the ocean, the wind and everything. It's just an incredible, just an incredible experience, really. And then, you know, getting to play, you know, in, in, in front of the orchestra with Steve conducting uh, just an incredible piece of music was just really surreal. I mean, it really was. And that was just an incredible month of music. And I really look forward to we uh, have another project like that uh, in the future. Talk a little bit about that Takamitsu piece with the mm -hmm. bells, with the... Exactly. So, yeah, so one of the component, components of the piece is that you have these hanging sort of um, chimes or bells, wind chimes, if you will, of varying sizes and pitch collections. And there's a moment where uh, two of the players who are situated in front of the orchestra sort of take, take the, the chimes and kind of pull them slowly and it just gives this feeling of like the wind blowing. And we had them we had them strung up up to the mezzanine. So they were literally hanging above people. So you could kind of hear the sound, not just from the front, but really from above, which was just, I think, wonderful. We sort of experimented, you know, quite a bit with them, where to hang them, the tension, you know, how fast to move them to get the sort of effect that we wanted. And yeah, the sound from beneath was really just, just spectacular. Um, that, I mean, that piece has so many interesting sort of sounds and colors that, 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 that come out as part of it. And certainly the, the, the bells and the wind chimes there are a significant, um, you know, sound palette in, in, the, in the piece. So it was really wonderful. Well, certainly late 19th century, 20th century, certainly 21st century, the, the range um, of percussion instruments is expanded. What is the earliest piece that uses percussion, would you say, in music history? So, you know, to my knowledge, uh, going back, um, in terms of sort of the Western sort of percussion that um, we think of that we see on stage, I mean, there was... You know, tri triangles, I think, came about, um, you know, timpani at some point, you know, just two drums. Um, there were actually like these, you know, tuned sleigh bells, um, at, you know, early on. You know, it didn't it didn't sort of get into, you know, drums and certainly, you know, mallet instruments or something into into much later. Certainly cultures all over the world, you know, on some level had, you know, different types of gongs and um, different objects that they use to make uh, rhythm. But I think, you know, in sort of Western classical sort of that tradition, I mean, I think you see, you know, early, like early triangles, that sort of a thing uh, happening. Um, and then it just sort of, I think it kind of grew uh, from there. Obviously the instrument is really, um, as we see it now, it's more of a function of the 20th century, I feel. Uh, and then now going forward, um, that's, so most of what people are seeing and hearing and listening to are, are obviously more coming from uh, from recent times. But I think if you look back in the repertoire, I mean, triangle might be the most, you know, the most composed for, you know, instrument. I mean, the, the, the little triangle. <laughs> well, you know, you think of percussion and dance, mm -hmm. of course. And then you mentioned Shostakovich 11. The other mm -hmm. place it occurs is in military, mm -hmm. militaristic influences in music. 
Exactly. And it's interesting, you know, I've been teaching uh, percussion for, for some time. And when it comes down to snare drumming, which to me, all percussion playing sort of comes back to being able to play on one surface. There's very much, I mean, in my humble opinion, I mean, people play drum set and whatnot, but you know, a rudimental approach to just playing a snare drum or one instrument, um, I find uh, very, very uh, useful pedagogically speaking, getting people to move their hands, to wrap their heads around, you know, rhythms that you then, <clears throat> excuse me, that you then see in the repertoire in things like Shostakovich. And so it's, it's interesting that, you know, sometimes you see players like, oh, it's a, it's a concert or orchestral player or a rudimental player or a world percussionist drum set player, but it's all very related and actually sort of the, the rudimental, um, you know, aspect of it, the, 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 the gentleman, you know, leading the army into battle, you know, with the drum hanging on the side, playing traditional grip, you know, it's, it's that sort of tradition that um, I think does certainly show itself in, in music that we play on the stage. And so there's, there's certainly that aspect of it, of the playing that I, I do find important, certainly for myself as a player, but also in uh, teaching all the students too. And rhythms you know have yeah. become so much more complex as mm -hmm. composers which is also part of your teaching i'm sure <clears throat> yes uh and so wrapping one's head around odd times odd meters odd groupings of notes and i think you'll see actually in this in in the uh, video at the end there's it's it's for two snare drums and there's there are some very strange quintuplets and strange accents and it would be hard to try to notate unless, unless you saw what we were trying to play from so that might be a good example of it but yeah trying to wrap your head around odd times and odd meters and odd collections of notes <clears throat> is certainly uh challenging as a player and but also uh to, to teach as well so um you mentioned timpani and one of your listeners today says, what is the difference between percussion, percussion sec um, section and timpani? So how do you decide which one you want to pursue? So it's a really good question. Um, I think when you're studying, um, and, and I think the, the, the pedagogy of percussion, I think has probably changed over time. I, I think some decades ago, you know, and, and it's still this case in some places, you, you would go to study a particular instrument or study percussion and really you would the focus was on learning everything on, on on some level really sort of you know immersing yourself in all the different you know instruments i think as time has gone on um there's there's become more of a focus on particular uh, areas within the instrument um and so even some orchestras i mean as far as i, I mean maybe even 10 years ago or something some orchestras actually had like a percussion and timpani that was one position but for many years, a lot of the bigger orchestras, um, and certainly with 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 ours as well, um, timpani has become you know its own separate instrument. I think partially because you know a, a lot of the repertoire. So if we're thinking you know Mozart, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, a lot of the Romantic, late classic, Beethoven, of course. Um, it's there's like almost only timpani involved in that, and there's very little percussion. It's not until the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, of course. And so there's there's a need there's a little bit of a need I think to focus on some level just on that instrument because it's sometimes the only instrument that's on the stage being played, and so also as time has gone on I, I think just in in the pedagogy of the instrument you know the level gets higher every year amongst and people are younger doing more unbelievable things it's really amazing uh, what some of the players that, and, and their youth and what they can do it's, I mean it's fantastic but that's what's happened. And so the need to sort of focus a little bit more specifically, I think, has come out of that. And so that is, if you're not focusing specifically on one area, um, it's, it's hard to be competitive against someone who is. Percussion, you can literally play all day long. I think some of our brass wind string playing colleagues, you know, there's a limit on in the hours per day. You can physically do something either because of their lips, their fingers, you know. But if we stay loose, we can all day just play all day long. And so it's a blessing and a curse in, in that, you know, there's all these instruments and, you know, you can focus on just one of them and get really good, you know, or you can kind of be okay at all of them, you know. So at some point to be competitive, at least in the orchestra world, I think you do have to on some level focus a little bit just on this, um, on, on the repertoire, on the instruments that we play on stage you know, on, on trying on trying to actually win, you know, win an audition, which is uh, not an easy thing to do. 
Well, that leads right into my next question. When you came to audition, what instruments did you bring? What were on the stage? How do you have to demonstrate <clears throat> your... Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So the other instruments of the orchestra, I mean, maybe except for harp, uh, I don't know, you know, kind of show up and uh, with their instrument, they bring it with them. So for us, uh, typically in the audition process, uh, the large instruments are provided. Sometimes uh, cymbals will be provided as well. Uh, you know, timpani will be provided. In fact, when we had a timpani audition, we had, you know, two sets of timpani, one what's called American setup, one's called German setup. <clears throat> so when I auditioned for the San Diego Symphony, there was a, you know, marimba, a xylophone, um, there was a, a glockenspiel, um, all, all the big bass drum, bass drum cymbals attached. Um, I think there might have been cymbals there. I think I may have also brought my own cymbals. <laughs> I think typically candidates are allowed to bring their own snare drum, maybe maybe their own cymbals, um, triangles, tambourines, castanets, smaller things, and the big instruments are typically provided. But you know, after you've been spent years practicing on particular instruments with particular you know bar spacing and bar width, and right. they have a certain height and the lights you know shining on them, and if it's a glockenspiel, it's shining back in your face where you can't see. There, there there's a whole sort of you know psychological thought process and um, preparation process to go through to try to you know overcome you know those difficulties that are inevitable with the reality of the situation. Uh, but certainly, um, you, you know, just experience and developing a comfort with you know if you if you know what type of instruments the orchestra is going to have you can try to track those down it's 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 a moving target but yeah typically the big instruments are provided and you're bringing the smaller instruments and you don't get to do you have time to warm up on the given instruments or you just go so typically there's a warm-up room with a different set of instruments <laughs> if you're lucky <laughs> If, if you're lucky and the orchestra was able to find the exact uh, an exact copy of the same gear and put it in the in the warm up room, which I find not very likely, <laughs> you never know. Uh, you know, you could be warming up on something completely different than what you play on the stage. And there's not really time. You can't really. You can kind of you can air through something. Say okay, just try to readjust really fast. You know, adjust the stand to the right height. You know, this you can go. You can practice going through a process. You know, and very quickly. So where you put your mallets down, you can very quickly go and fix everything the best you can. <clears throat> so nothing's shining in your face, the heights are correct. You can, you know, just practice starting the thing silently in your head. There's there's a whole sort of, you know, process to go through, I think that, that one does and obviously doing going through mock audition processes, but yeah, you don't often have the opportunity to play on the actual instrument until you play that first note sometimes. I'll tell you, the audition process never ceases to amaze me, the challenges and how you all do it, so. It's pretty amazing, and I think percussion and timpani certainly it presents kind of a, a unique challenge that's different from the other instruments. No question yeah. about it. Well, I think we have a fabulous percussion section and a fab fabulous timpanist, um, so we're really thrilled. We have one, one, lots of good comments coming in saying okay. how fascinating this is and everybody's learning so much, and then Hal Fusen, was a great question. It says, have you ever thought about trying to convince Raphael to introduce a little bossa nova into the repertoire? A little bossa, you know, I would be completely game and all for that uh, in every way, shape and form. So yeah, I have not uh, broached the topic with him, but um, I would certainly uh, be in favor of all things groovy and uh, that would certainly be one of them. Yeah. That's great. Greg, thank you. And I'm looking forward to this next piece. Um, and Jen's about to come back on, but this is our last Lunch and Listen of the year 2020. Um, and so uh, we will take a little break here and we'll be back in January 2021 and looking forward to that. But can I just say a big thank you to you, Greg, and all of your colleagues who have been here on Tuesdays. It's just been such a joy for me personally and I know for our listeners. Well, it's my pleasure. It's an honor to be able to speak to you, uh, Martha, and to everybody who's listening. And I want to thank everyone for all their continued support and wish everybody a happy holiday and a happy new year. Thank you so much. And a healthy new year as well.